Hello. Thank you all for being here and giving up your free time to, to meet and um, hopefully we'll learn from each other as well. Um, I wanted to do this talk because uh, this is my first time in a startup and um, when I was coming from the outside, I would have been curious about this. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen first. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you. So as Dan said, um, he and Elisa will be monitoring the chat. If, if uh, they see a question that's better asked in context of what I'm talking about, um, please uh, do, uh, Dan, Elisa, do uh, reach out and feel free to interrupt me. And thank you for monitoring the chat because uh, I always find it a little tricky to try to, to do both and also stay on target with what I'm doing, uh, what I'm speaking about. Um, but anyway, so um, this has been my experience as docs uh, in a startup being one of the first in the door, part of the original doc team. Um, I started at Replicated, it's, um, it's almost a year ago now, and um, I'm a senior technical writer there. Uh, most of my experience has been with network management software. I've done other types of software as well. Um, my experience with Kubernetes technology technology is only two years worth, so I'm not really super technical with that yet, but I spent a year at Red Hat and now a year at Replicated, um, both of which use the Kubernetes technology. And um, I joined Replicated and was interested in a startup because I really wanted to have more autonomy and I wanted to help build something, really craft something and take all of my years of experience and try to really take the best of that and, and create something really great. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about Replicated, um, but Replicated is a company, it's also a product. And it is, um, we wrap around applications that vendors are trying to deploy into Kubernetes clusters. Um, Kubernetes is containerized deployment of applications. Um, it allows, better management of resources when applications are running, um, and it's become very, very popular. But Kubernetes technology is extraordinarily difficult. There really aren't a lot of engineers out there who have a lot of expertise around that. And so therefore, there aren't really a lot of technical writers either that have a lot of expertise. When I came in the door, it replicated a year of, of, of my experience um, with Kubernetes was actually, you know, kind of golden. Um, so anyone who's looking for opportunities to expand into new technology, um, Kubernetes uh, is, is a good way to go. But it is difficult for vendors to deploy their applications um, with Kubernetes. And so our product, Replicated, uh, makes it easier to do that. Um, that being said, it is not easy. Um, now, I need to tell you a little bit about who our audience is. It's dif different than when I've worked in the past. Usually I've had a highly technical audience, but it's been one audience. But with the replicated product, we have vendors taking their application to deploy it, but then their, their users are enterprise users who are highly technical and they are um, needing to uh, white label the, the user interface that they give to uh, that I'll, I'll back up a second. There are two interfaces. There's one for our vendors. There's one for our enterprise or their enterprise users. And um, those enterprise users actually manage the application through that user interface that we provide with Replicated. So they will do things like do backup and restore. Um, they will manage their licenses and um, other kinds of features through that. And so the vendors that buy our Replicated product brand it um, but with their own logo and send that out to the enterprise users. And so our documentation has to be written so that it helps the vendor succeed, but also helps their users succeed because the vendor takes our enterprise documentation from our GitHub repo and makes it available with their own branding on it to their end users. So most of the time, the enterprise end user never even sees the name replicated, but all of our vendors do because they're working directly with us. There's also a CLI behind those, um, and that's hot, heavily used but behind those two interfaces. But we have to make sure that we set our vendors up to succeed by making sure that the documentation is written for both audiences. So it's a little bit different and complex, um, and that's going to factor into how 
we have approached things here. So um, I'm going to pose what some of the challenges are and what our environment is and give a little detail on that, then go into the solutions and then what's next for us. Um, so with this, the problems that we faced coming in the door, there was no docs team whatsoever. There was documentation. It was written by the engineers. It was actually um, fairly well written in that it was rich in conceptual information. Uh, but it was also written, one of our vendors said, you need a PhD to, to understand what's been written. So it was very advanced um, information. It was also incomplete. It didn't really say what they were trying to do, why they were trying to do that, and it didn't give any task-based information. Um, so that was really, really difficult and painful for the vendors. Um, so um, because there was this very technical information that we needed to come in and rewrite that posed a challenge, but it posed a challenge also for the vendors. Um, and so um, when uh, I'll go into that a little further here, um, it was difficult for vendors to find the information they needed because there are multiple websites uh, with documentation on them. So replicated we have our paid for product, which is replicated, but we also have developed and maintain open source technology. And so there are multiple websites for that. Replicated product builds on those technologies, but provides proprietary um, paid for features. And that's what makes it worth paying for the license. Um, most of the documentation for the replicated product was on the COTS IO website. COTS is also one of the open source underlying technologies. Um, it was a very scant website, even though it was the main content. Um, it was cross-referencing other open source sites that we maintain, and it wasn't very usable. So you couldn't navigate. There was no content strategy. Um, vendors had a leapfrog experience. They had to jump from one site to another to find out what to do. And there was no path through the product on how they would package their application. And there was no path through the product for their enterprise users on how they would install anything, how they would monitor things. There was just absolutely a very disjointed, fractured experience. Experience. Um, in addition to that, there was another site, and there still is, called help.replicated.com, and that linked to the current doc set and the legacy products that we had, but it wasn't clear when a user land there, they would might be using the current replicated product, but they were looking at the legacy product documentation, and it's very different, but they didn't know they were in the wrong place. Um, there's a community help area there, which is very good, um, but a lot of that content really needed to be migrated to, especially the COTS IO site, and it hadn't been. So it was uh, a lot for us to consider as we were coming up with solutions and, like I said, a very difficult experience for our users. Um, so a little bit about the environment before I go into the solutions. So as I said, there was no existing documentation team. And with a lot of startups um, that I had interviewed with, um, I was very leery about going into an environment where I would be the only doc writer. I did not want to be someplace where I was going to be working 16 hours a day forever. Um, I wanted to be someplace where they understood that documentation um, is uh, something that takes time uh, to do well. Um, it's a skill set and um, where they understood that it could be part of the solution of um, helping their customers succeed. And so um, to the credit of the CEO here, Grant Miller, our CTO, Mark Campbell, our C team, they understood that documentation is critical to their success. So they plan to have multiple writers start at once or in the reasonable time frame. So we started like four to six weeks apart and there were three writers that came on board together. Um, there was no content strategy to start with. Of course, that was, well, I mentioned that before. Um, part of our environment um, is that we have weekly feature work uh, iterations. So in the past, when I've worked with Agile, I think the smallest sprint we ever had was a two week sprint and that was pretty common. And there would be a general release, even though you can technically release 
you know, code and documentation at the end of a sprint, but rarely was that ever done wherever I worked. Um, but here we iterate every week, we release every week. And so there is, it's a very fast paced um, environment. Um, and so there was a question of how do we do the feature work and also retrofit and do whatever solutions we were going to do with the existing documentation. Um, we had to deal with that. Um, we work with Docs as Code. I've only been working with Docs as Code for two years. I came out of DITA for a number of years and before that, some proprietary uh, single sourcing tools and some Madcap Flare. And um, it just seems in recent years that Docs as Code has become more prevalent and DITA was going away. And so I was very curious and um, well informed by the poll uh, is to see where things have we're at and was my perception correct? But as I was interviewing, docs as code was, was prevalent. Now, um, in startups anyway, and there are a lot of advantages to docs as code for those of you who haven't worked with it before. Um, some of the upsides are that uh, other engineers can uh, open what's called a pull request or a PR and make changes to the docs and um, as a documentation team, we actually review them. We make sure they're technically accurate. We can rewrite anything. We can put it in the right place in the table of contents or in the navigation and make sure it fits with what we're doing, but the content can be written by someone else and we can get it in very quickly and it can save us work. And also anyone, it, it is a public repo in GitHub, so anyone can contribute to the docs as well. The downside with da docs as code is that, um, what I find to be a downside anyway, is that it makes reuse very difficult. There are things called snippets, but they don't really scale well if you have multiple writers. Um, uh, hyperlinks uh, or cross-references are not dynamic. Um, so there's a lot more maintenance in that way. Um, and um, um, as I said before, we had a lot of positive support coming in the door from the C team, which I didn't really, when I was interviewing with other companies, didn't have that same level of um, engagement and welcoming and interaction. Um, the other thing that um, was done that was very smart was that um, documentation was made part of the product team. And we report into product and we are partners with them. Um, our product managers are um, very active and engaged um, as, as partners with us. They review um, all of our documentation and um, they um, answer a lot of our questions. Um, so it's, it's a really great collaborative environment. Um, with any new job that you come into and a team of new writers coming in, uh, of course, there's always the need to prove yourself in a new job. So there was that pressure coming in the door. That was one of the challenges. Um, not only is Kubernetes a complex technology, but so is replicated as a technology in order to write about it. So we didn't have time to learn the content and the technology intimately, um, but we still needed to show results. Um, we work with Slack chats um, as our main form of communication within the company. We don't have an office. Um, we are uh, permanently remote and um, that has not been a disadvantage. Um, there's a lot of transparency through Slack chat, but it also means that you're switching context a lot, which can be challenging when you're trying to hunker down and write. So that's part of our environment. And as I said, feature work was still being done. And then the other thing about a startup is that there is this need for speed and to show results. And there are very high expectations. Every company I interviewed with had high expectations and nothing was different here in that way. Um, but these were reasonable expectations. And so um, there wasn't the luxury of, okay, we're going to take a year and we're going to really figure out very granularly what our content strategy would be, what should go where, what should be consolidated. Um, it, and then we can roll out this beautiful finished uh multi-tiered wedding cake of documentation with bows and flowers on it. And it's just gorgeous. No, we had to find another way to, to show results um, and keep moving forward, um, but make it meaningful and well done. Um, another challenge we had is that we don't have an internal uh, tools team for the docs. And every company I've worked at before, we've had uh, a tools team that would manage our publishing pipeline and manage our CMS and, and all those different things. And we didn't have that. So um, none of us had the expertise to know what kind of website, like if we wanted to do a website refresh, what should we do? What kind of um, previews to work with? How do we actually physically manage those tools? We didn't have that. 
So those were our challenges in the environment that we were in. Um, so we had some solutions. And the main thing we wanted to solve um, to start with is that fractured leapfrog vendor experience with our documentation. So we wanted to migrate everything to a new, highly usable website. I'm going to show you some slides as to how bad our previous website was. <laughs> and then I'll show you the new website. And you'll see it is a world of different experience. Um, so we needed something fresh and usable. And we wanted to centralize the information with the knowledge that we still have to maintain those open source sites. We didn't want a lot of overlap and redundancy and high maintenance between the sites. But at the same time, we wanted vendors to come to the one site, get most of what they need. And then if they need something from, from one of the open source sites, it would be more of a reference thing than, oh, how do I do something? I've got to jump all over the place. Um, another thing we wanted to solve was how do you use the product? We needed workflows. What's the path through the product as a vendor? What are the paths through um, the different uh, components that the enterprise users um, have to do? And then we wanted to improve the quality of the actual content, create tasks, um, and fill the content gaps. Um, we knew we could not do all of this at once. So we decided to use a phased approach in order to deliver um, results quickly. Last December, we were looking at what, we, what are we going to use for <laughs> our, our website. And we also had to get buy-in from everybody that, yes, we're going to go to this centralized website. So that took a little while, the first few months, getting a basic content strategy in place took a couple months. So by December, we were looking at, okay, what website, what tools are we going to use? And we had, we started, we stopped, and we had to restart again because what we originally were using or going to use didn't really work for us well. So we ended up going with Docusaurus um, for our web publishing. Uh, we're using Markdown. Um, we tried to go with ASCII doc, uh, which I had used before at Red Hat, but actually that didn't work very well. And we went back to Markdown, just plain vanilla Markdown. Um, Docusaurus has um, a good CSS. It's flexible. They give you a lot coming in the door, but you can also um, uh, edit that CSS to make it work for your needs. Um, Gatsby JS is our static um, website generator, and um, Netlify is for previews. So when we merge a pull request into the main repo, the main branch, that goes live almost immediately to our vendors so um, or to our website. So we need it a way to have previews that others could review before we merge those. Um, and our internal web expertise came from other engineers, engineering managers, um, the marketing team. They actually helped us set up all of this or we would have been in a lot of trouble. So, so, much, so many thanks to them. Um, we decided to migrate the content from the main site. We started that just about after Christmas. We went live March 1st. <laughs> so we had two months to actually do the content migration we decided we were going to rewrite only enough for a first usable path uh, pass. So that included, um, there was some redundant content scattered everywhere that didn't make any sense. We wanted to consolidate that information. We went with the high level content strategy. We improved things that were critical um, installation information. We um, turned into task-based um, uh uh, proceed, you know, we turned into procedures um, uh, with the numbered steps. We did some rewriting on that. We did a bare minimum style guide where we all agree that we need to word things in this way for tasks. We need to word things this way for headings on concepts versus these other things, just the basic things so that we wouldn't have to retrofit the what we were doing initially. Um, and so the um, the flow of the documentation on the new site was much better. And then when we uh, were ready, we notified our vendors of the new site and our commitment to the quality docs because it was important that we communicate that we are becoming a mature product and the documentation is reflective of that and the commitment um, is really high from replicated. So I think a picture is worth a thousand words here. So let me show you what the website used to look like. Um, so this is the before, um, replicated is barely branded here. Cots is the open source. You go to the site and 
you get um, a plug-in from here, um, which is still uh, viable now. But at the top here, you have these, I guess you would call them tabs. And it's really not clear that this is necessarily documentation. If you look at vendor and admin console, it's not clear what's there for you. Um, and then if you were to click into these pieces of documentation, you're just stuck in one area of like, here's the admin console, which is for the enterprise users. But vendors, when they package their application, they need to test it as the end user and they need to go back and forth easily between those sets of content. And they need to also go to the reference content, which has CLI reference that they may need. And so they can't, they could not navigate that easily from here. So it was a pretty miserable experience for them. And so the new site with doc, oh, no, that's, here it is. Okay. The new site, it's very clear that they've landed at the docs page um, here. Um, we still have vendor, we named admin console enterprise. So it's very easy for a new customer, a new vendor to understand when they're switching before, between the doc sets and understand what role they're taking on. Are they functioning as a vendor? Are they functioning as their own customer when they're testing? And when you drill down into these, you actually can navigate between everything. So let me just go live, if I can get to that tab somewhere in here. Uh, so this is our live site, um, and it's a little bit easier to, uh, to see. Um, so this is, you can see that you can go between the documentation pretty easily. Um, I wanted to show you this first before I drill down any further. When you landed in the vendor documentation before, you would see that, okay, there are some getting started guides here. And it's like, oh, what's the difference between this quick start and existing cluster? And so you can see some of the headings are very clear. They're all getting started, but what does that do? There's a whole lot of tutorials here that aren't necessarily clear that they're tutorials and they're actually advanced tutorials that you don't need until later. There's no entry point. How do I get started? How do I package an application? Uh, nothing like that. Um, so now when you expand the vendor uh, content, you get a workflow. Uh, we didn't have this when we rolled out on March 1st. This is something we prioritized and added afterwards, but this is an end-to-end -end workflow on how you package your production application as a vendor. Um, there are very clear pre prerequisites now. We tell you that you need to set up a development server. We tell you to create an account. This is a process topic or a workflow. So from this, you can click down and get into specific procedures to do anything in here. We let them know, um, go ahead, create a tutorial to package, distribute and, and with a sample application and you can click to whichever flavor you want. If you'd want to work with the, with the command line, you can do that. If you have an existing cluster you wanna test with, great. If you don't want to, well, we can provide a VM for you. Um, and so we have a way that your uh, enterprise users can work uh, without an existing cluster. And then the initial release, we want them up and running as quickly as possible. And there's some things that they have to do up front. They do it the one time for the initial release and then they iterate and it's very complex. There are choices. Are you using a private registry? Yes or no. So we wanted to give them a diagram that had a decision tree that they could navigate through. And you can see getting set up and getting through to your first release uh, and testing it and promoting it is, is um, a, a bit of a long process. A diagram is really not enough for our product. We really want to give some explanation to them and um, some context for each of those steps and then um, give them links to click through to whatever they need. If they want to import using a standard manifest file, they can go here. And so these are all the steps that support the diagram. And then iterating on future releases um, is important. And there's a recommended flow for our product. They can skip around um, enterprise users have very different environments. And so they have to tailor their packaging around what they're trying to deliver. And so they need to test after every step. For example, if they're adding database configurations, they'll want to add that, test the release, and then iterate on adding the next piece of it. So we give an explanation about the functionality they might want to add. They can click through to get the procedure again, and they have a description. And then we tell them how to distribute the application. Um, and then we have the quick start tutorials here. We reworded uh, or renamed them 
Again, we added task-based information there. They're not completely rewritten, but they're much better than they were. Um, and we bubbled to the top <laughs> of this uh, a customer application deployment questionnaire that had been buried um, before um, that now is very helpful to them. So those are some of the improvements that we, that we made on the vendor side. Um, on the enterprise side, I'm trying to keep an eye on the time there. Um, so this is the end user enterprise side. Um, the first thing they need to do is they need to install the application. And it, it's not bad. You come here, it's like installing a, well, what is a COTS application? They're not going to know what that is. Uh, aren't I installing my vendor application? <laughs> Who is COTS? We don't know. <laughs> As an enterprise user, we don't know. It's very confusing. And then there are installation methods. Oh, okay, existing cluster or embedded Kubernetes. What is that? Online or air gap? Okay. Um, just for those of you who don't know, an air gap installation is uh, for uh, when there's no internet access. Um, for example, a government, they need more security, they need to install in a more secure environment. So there's a way to do that. But then you get down to namespace or namespaces. What is that about? What does that have to do with the installation? What do images and internal registries have to do? And stateful components, why is that down here on the bottom of this, this little navigation here, what does that have to do with installation? Well, we made it a little more obvious. Um, we, under the enterprise users, we now have an overview and I'm gonna go to that live. So it's easier to see. Okay, so um, here now it's like, oh, you install with or that an existing cluster. That's a little more obvious. You have the option of installing in an air-gapped environment. We tell them they can do that on an existing cluster or provisioned cluster. And we rename things. Well, this is what namespaces have to do with installation. You have to provide some access. Um, you might need to deploy some images with the local registries if you're an enterprise user. You may want to use a GitOps um, version control workflow. Um, we made installation requirements very clear before there were just some very lightweight system requires it was requirements it wasn't extensive it wasn't consolidated in one place now we tell you what your supported browsers are version compatibility with uh, kubernetes um, minimum system requirements for the different types of um, install installation options and firewall openings and one of the th nice things about um, docusaurus is you get this nice right hand nav too which is so much easier to find things um, and again, before you get to installing, you, there are some additional requirements for the admin console state. And this was the stateful components uh, uh, thing at the bottom down here. I don't know if you can really see, oops, that didn't help, did it? Um, right around here. Um, that didn't make any sense before, but now when you come to the new content, it's it's renamed and it's a lot clearer. And the actual content itself is better too. And it, I'm not, I didn't work on this topic, so I don't know why it's separate from the installation requirements, but I know there's a good reason for it. And um, it is much more extensive information than existed before. It explains why and how you would um, do this. Um, and then the actual um, installing uh, information is much better. There, there were no numbered steps before. It's very clear what the prerequisites are. Um, we link because we can't do um, uh, content sharing easily. We just link to it. Uh, that's because it stocks as code, but it's very clear what type of installation you're going to. And the Kubernetes installer before was, it was <laughs> very difficult to follow. This has had a complete rewrite. Um, it, we had a lot of feedback uh, recently that um, it's been working very well um, for customers. They've been able to go through it uh, on their own, and that's just a real win for our team. But just a lot of improvements like that. We're still rolling things out that, um, that way to make the content richer and easier to follow. It was very scant um, before. Um, Oh, one other thing I did want to point out that was important is that um, in the the need to make the main content site um, more viable so that there doesn't need to be leapfrogging to these other sites, the perspective really is that 
if you're a customer and you're paying for our product, we should be giving you the best in class documentation on our main site. I personally believe strongly in that. I've been in marketing and sales before. Um, I know the pain from directly from the customers and that way. So we're actually now at this point working with um, our support teams, um, trying to prioritize what should be worked on. And so um, one of the things that we did was um, just wanted to show this topic off because um, it was just so scant before. Um, it was unbelievable. Um, this had maybe three paragraphs on this page and it's such an important feature. And then they'd have to go to the troubleshoot site and jump all over the place with that. And now there's all of this conceptual information that wasn't there before, but it, it actually takes you through the flow, how these pieces tie together. It all relates collectors, redactors, and analyzers all relate to pre-flight checks and support bundles, but now you can read all about it and then really get into it, and there are specific examples here. You can copy the code um, and take it and paste it into a manifest and start um, altering it from there, but it's very, very, very clear as to how this works, um, and it doesn't duplicate what's on the other sites, and this is the important thing. It actually makes it easier for a, a vendor to come in here, get everything they need. And then if they just want to say, oh, what do I do for this add-on? Let me just see as a reference, go to the other site. And conversely, if you are an open source user and you want to actually really know how to use this, you can come to our main doc site. It's public. You can actually learn everything there and then jump back and get what you need. Um, and uh, and who knows, maybe that'll attract more customers than to us. Um, so I'm actually really proud about that, but it's also starting to reduce the support burden, which is really important. So um, for migration success key factors, um, again, we did the phased approach uh, with the minimal rewriting and condensing content and making it a little bit more usable and um, definitely easier to find and navigate for the first rollout. Um, early and continual communication between us as writers was critical. Um, we worked so well together. Everybody put aside their egos. We felt very quickly felt comfortable around each other saying, oh my God, I'm so frustrated by this. I'm running into this problem here. I have these ideas. We could go this way or that way. What do you all think about it? And so together we had this incredible synergy and we got each other unblocked um, and it was great. And we had that same support outside the team, but within our docs team, that was pretty critical. And then before we rolled out that that doc site, the new doc site, when the preview was ready, we asked our um, key stakeholders to come in. And one of the most um, pivotal ones was the head of customer success. Now, his team is responsible for doing proof of concept um, for our uh, prospective customers, and then also supporting um, customers that have actually signed a contract and we want them to succeed and giving them the handholding necessary. And that whole packaging iteration workflow for vendors is very, very tricky. We didn't know really what the reliable order was or the best order. You could not tell from the navigation on the original site what order you should do things in. So he helped us prioritize what do we absolutely need to have in rolling out this doc site, doc site live the first time. And then what do we need to do right after we roll out that doc site and what can wait? And really went in depth with us through the technology. And that was just a brilliant, brilliant collaboration. So grateful to him on that. Um, again, the minimal necessary style guide. And now we just iterate as we go with that. Another really smart thing that we did um, for our own sanity um, was to take all of the old topics, the names of the topic, link to them, map it to the new topic, especially helpful when you're trying to consolidate three topics into one and the link to the new topic. And as it turned out, um, the trust that we had from um, our, the rest of the organization, there was a lot of trust there, but it wasn't blind trust. And when we rolled out the new website, they were like, oh, where did this go? Where did that go? And that spreadsheet was really helpful to say, it's here, it's here, it's here. So everything did get taken over uh, to the new site. And then um, we set up redirects for our vendors. Um, the old site was so difficult to use that people had to bookmark what they needed so they could find it easily. So they were relying on the, those bookmarks and we wanted them to get to exactly what they needed uh, without any search on the new site. Um, they just automatically linked to that. 
Um, we had some strategies and tactics around that. I know we're running a little bit low on time here and I want to leave time for Q&A. Um, so we talked about the collaboration, um, but I think one of the critical things to point out here is that we did future pr proofing from day one on this. Um, some of us had been in the very painful situation of um, inheriting processes around docs as code that did not scale in our previous organization. It made it so painful to write, um, and not just around docs as code, but also processes in terms of getting things approved and reviewed and everything like that. So we came in the door as writers, we all agreed everything, every decision that we make, no matter what it is, it has got to scale to the day where we've got 50 plus writers. Um, and so that's uh, been a brilliant um, uh, cornerstone in what we do. Um, we also inherited quite a lot of stories in our backlog, even though we don't work as agile, we still track with, with stories. And um, we do story sizing and velocity just so we can, on a weekly basis now, do what we need to do. We still now have to do feature work, but we're also working on uh, content improvements, so we need to balance those well. But all of the stories that we inherited in our backlog, we were not here for. We did not, we did not triage them. It was just what we inherited and there was a lot of redundancy and it was, I mean, hundreds of stories and we had to find a way to manage that. So we decided to use epics as categories instead to just like throw this in this bucket, throw this in that bucket. They were just buckets and then we could take each bucket or each category and say, oh, here's some redundancy. We don't use the epic to say, oh, we're going to do all of these stories and then the epic is done. We don't care about that. What we want to do is be able to prioritize within that bucket. What do we really need to do now? What can we do later? What can we throw away? Um, so that was really cool. And then we work in smaller chunks because we have to iterate. Uh, our, our improvements can take two or to three weeks, but feature work has to be done in one week, but we still don't want to drag things out. Um, Everything has to be technically accurate, so we want to make the workload on engineering and on product management for reviews as easy as possible. And we also do peer reviews on, on each other's work. It has to be manageable. So smaller chunks for that reason um, are important. But also the, the philosophy is that, well, look, anything we do is better than what we've had before. <laughs> so <laughs> that's another reason where we can say, okay, if I'm only putting out this little piece this week. I mean, it may have taken me 10 hours to do it because it's so elaborate, but it's still a smaller chunk from the bigger picture. It's still an improvement. So that's uh, really cool. And um, a really great commitment that our organization has, they've had it from day one, they still have it, um, is that everybody is expected to contribute to documentation. If you're in engineering, if you're in PM, customer success, you know, our CEO, he contributes to documentation. They'll open a PR, they'll pair with us on that. And they'll also, they're also always willing to help us um, review and make sure it's technically accurate. Um, so I really love that about this startup environment and that we are just their partners. And then just in terms of our um, culture, the overall culture at Replicated. I mean, I can't say enough good things about it. I can't say enough good thing, uh, things about our, our, our docs team culture either. When we rolled out that doc site on March 1st and then we were able to go <sighs> for a day, <laughs> just take that breath and then move forward. We, in taking that breath, we realized, oh my God, we have an amazing team here. It's, it's, it, and what do we want for the future? We want did to build, we asked and answered that question, we want to build a first class docs team. If you could just wave a magic wand and go, this is my dream team. This is my dream way of running a department. This is my dream you know, way of doing processes and, and everything. This is what it is. So it's again, beginning with the end in mind and making sure we do everything we can to support that. So our manager um, created interview questions that really pull out um, the, we haven't put them to the test yet. We aren't really hiring yet, um, but we already have interview questions um, that will help um, pull out stories uh, from prospective candidates that demonstrate uh, collaboration and the way of thinking that really can help us uncover, are they a good match? Um, because it has to, of course, mutually be a good match. And also um, she's putting really clear career path, um, not just, oh, here's your title, but here's what you would do to earn that. This is how you would, um, you know, 
measure it, that sort of thing. And so to really make it attractive to you, uh, to, 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 to prospective candidates. And um, just on the right side here, I just have some things that helped me in this journey. Um, having a growth mindset. Um, we all have a combination of growth and fixed mindset. This YouTube talk is fantastic. She has a book, uh, Carol Dweck, um, that also elaborates on that. And then Elizabeth Gilbert has this amazing book about creative thinking, but it really doesn't just apply to let me craft something, you know, with paints or something like that. It's about creativity in every aspect of your life, personal and professional. It's not just about fear. It's about every aspect of life and the way she writes and the humor, but the depth. I can't say enough good things about this book. I wish it had been written 20 years ago and my life would be completely even better now than it is. But, you know, it took her time to learn those things too. But anyway, those are, those are the, um, uh, things I highly recommend. Um, and then just ongoing, uh, again, reducing the support team burden, trying to get metrics. And I'd say the other really thing, important thing here is now we're setting quarterly objectives and key results, which is fantastic for prioritizing because there's so much work that we need to do and so that we can stay focused and sane <laughs> and say, this is what we can accomplish uh, and what we will accomplish. Um, it's really nice at the end of the week to say, did that, we're really working towards these goals. And um, so it's a very exciting time for us now um, at Replicated and, and Replicated Docs. And that has been my journey. Does anybody have any questions? Cool. Thanks, Jonquil. Yes. Applause. I, I don't want to hit the reaction button while I'm talking. But uh, yeah, that was a really good talk. Um, a lot of the things you said chimed with me uh, in my time as a, as a writer in a scale-up that felt like a startup. Um, and actually, I do have a question uh, for you. Actually, Elisa, you've asked the question that I was kind of thinking of, but you phrased it better than I did. Um, uh, I'm curious how long this transformation process took from beginning to end. Also, how big was the docs team? And did you build that team out gradually or all at once? I know you have a few um, of your colleagues here tonight. Take myself off mute. Yes. Um, so I was hired in September. Um, uh, Paige, well, I came on board in September, I should say. Paige came on board mm -hmm. in November and there was a writer first in the door uh, in August, July. Um, so uh, within months of each other, the first writer in the door started laying down the groundwork for we need to consolidate everything into one doc site. And so she paved the way with that and did the initial um, content strategy. Uh, we onboarded very quickly. We started with three writers. We now just have two writers because mm. one writer did uh, leave. And so the two of us did the, the bulk of the migration. Um, but um, there was so much groundwork that was done by the third writer. Um, it, we actually started, the content strategy was figured out by the beginning of November. And then we were trying to figure out what tool to use, what kind of website tools. Um, and so we actually started and stopped and restarted because the first tool was no good. So we actually started the migration in January of this year and went live March 1st. So it was two wow. months for the actual migration and re release. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, Lisa has a question. What is the dev to writer ratio in your company? Um, we have Roughly. two, yeah, we have two engineering teams. Um, I don't know, Paige, uh, what have we got? Maybe eight engineers on each team. So maybe eight to one. Yeah, I was going to say, may, yeah, maybe 10 to 15 engineers total. Actually, Justin is here. One of our PMs is here. He might have a better idea. <laughs> we are expanding the engineering team. And by the way, this is uh, Paige uh, Calvert, my, my cohort, uh, friend, partner, manager. We just, uh, yeah, it's really great. And yeah, our, our PMs are here too. We are expanding the engineering um it is going to expand further, but it has not been um, difficult to support this so far. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for answering a few questions. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and uh, Sandeep, I see you have a question. You have a raised hand there. Want to go yeah. Ahead? Uh, so great steps uh, there by John Hill and, and the team. Uh, super quick question is about the impact. So how did you measure that the new docs portal is doing better than the old and um, you know how did you cascade that information up uh, to the management to show that you know the investment is paying off 
Yeah, so that's a good question. So Replicated um, has about 100 employees, so there is a lot of transparency. And we added um, a data um, analytics team recently. So they are getting a lot of insight to our actual um, uh, adoption of the different features in the vendor portal and things like that. We don't yet have things in place that can measure uh, whether or not uh, there is a reduction, let's say, in support tickets that's directly related to documentation. Those are things that we hope to get um, eventually. So right now we're leaning on anecdotal information. But because our company is small, and because there has so much focus on us, it, it was a big investment bringing in three writers and saying, oh gosh, you know, part of our success and growing this product is is part is is docs and um, uh, and Cindy, you and I have worked together before at CA <laughs> Technologies where we did not have insights like that at all. It's a completely different yeah. perspective, right? So um, this is just a completely, yeah, completely different experience. Um, they actively, uh, everyone from the CEO downward uh, goes into the documentation routinely, and they're more than happy to say, hey, you need an improvement there, or this is great. And we also um, have a product um uh, improvements or uh, I forget what we call it, the weekly product update that goes out every Monday that talks about what each engineering team, the highlights, not everything they've done, but the highlights they've done and also documentation has a section about the highlights. So it's a quick way for everyone to look and say, oh, what is documentation done that's really, they think is great, is new, and let's go in there and take a look at it and examine it. So it's mostly anecdotal at this part, at this point. Sure. Thank you so much. The reason I was asking is, you know, it's, it's rare to find organizations where everyone is aligned. And when you do, you know, it's pretty easy to steer the ship and, you know, and achieve the kind of stuff that uh, your team has done. Great stuff. Yeah, thank you. Cool. We have um, another couple of questions and I'll just ask them as I see them. Um, what collaborate, collaboration tools do you guys use? One person asks. Leo, I think. Oh, okay. Um, so our main communication tool is Slack. Um, we do try to pair in person when it makes sense. And sometimes more, uh, we, we found that we needed to do it more frequently. Uh, we kind of pulled back from Zoom meetings with engineers and PM and then we're like, oh, we're not getting everything we need. Let's ask for meetings. Um, and we try to make them very, very focused. Um, uh, but we also, uh, Paige and I do a biweekly retro um, mm -hmm. We use uh, a Trello board to capture that. Um, it's something what went well, what could have gone better, what questions do we have, uh, what, you know, and what improvements do we want to make. And it's always been a very safe space. It's, there's no blame on anyone in the organization or each other or ourselves. It's a place where we can vent because there's a problem or we can celebrate things. We do take time to celebrate things we've done well. Um, sometimes, you know, we just need to wear a tiara to the meeting because we need to feel better or we want to celebrate something. <laughs> but um, but we, we, from that, we like, okay, okay. So when things don't go well, we, we, we use that tool to just track what can we do? What action items do we take? Uh, and then we follow up on that and hold ourselves accountable two weeks later. Uh, so um, uh, we revisit that. That's a great tracking tool. Um, I'm trying to think what else that what else we're using. Um, we pair. We do. We do our doc stand ups every day. So there's a lot of communication. They're very short, but we do that. And we have a planning meeting every Monday for documentation. Mm -hmm. We use our. Um, yeah, I think those are the main ones. Our OKRs are captured in a handbook. Our style guide is in, uh, the, the handbook is actually a wiki. Um, it's a free open source wiki. I'm trying to think on our page if there's anything else that we use that's particularly interesting. Miro board is pretty cool for oh, anyone yeah. else who is a remote worker. It kind of gives you just a big whiteboard space with sticky notes and you can create shapes in different spaces. So it's really good for like free form brainstorming. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. That was very useful for us when we were trying to figure out what goes into packaging <laughs> and when we were working with the head of customer success to um, have him explain that. I see, uh, Leo, you have a raised hand there. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, so we, uh, hi, thanks so much for um, what, you, what you're doing for, uh, for this uh, Zoom meeting. I thank you. Um, we document SOPs and best practices. I wanted to know if you had any 
thoughts on on um, maybe differences with respect to what you're talking about to help us uh, improve on that? Um, I'm not, I, I guess I'm not really clear. Um, I'm not, uh, yeah, I've never worked with SOPs really or not very much before. And best practices, are you talking about internal best practices for writers or can you be more, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so we have uh, assistants that go through, they help different clients and they utilize these best practices and SOPs all the time. So they're constantly accessing them. And so we're looking for uh, best, you know, be <laughs> best practices on how to document that. And so that's what attracted me to this uh, webinar. Uh -huh. I'm hoping to get some insights into that. We're, we're struggling a little bit. And it's funny you say there about scalability. It has to be built in from the beginning. And, you know, so we've been really plugging that home and make sure that whatever we're doing is scalable because we already ran into some problems early on where it wasn't scalable and it was a, we saw the problems it created as it got bigger. Hmm. Okay. Um, that's a little bit tricky. Um, I'm not sure I have a complete answer for you. I think for us, in my personal perspective has always been that the documentation should always be documenting best practices. So I've never been you know, and and if you're in a consulting group or some other kind of situation, what I'm saying may not have any validity whatsoever um, for you. But um, I've never personally been a big, big fan of having a separate best practice guide versus the main documentation. That main documentation just needs to be improved. Um, but that being said, if you're talking about best practices and if you're really talking about workflows, how do you get from A to Z or do you want to do an example? Right, workflows, uh-huh. That's a right. Too. Yeah. So, um, and you can do those with or without examples, or I've worked with, um, like with network management where it's like, okay, there's a very specific environment that somebody is in and we really need to tell them, well, they need to set up some, they're, they're using a radius server in this environment and there are very specific things that they need to, to consider versus somebody who's doing, you know, something without a radius server. And so that could potentially be um, a, a separate guide. Um, but if you're, if that's easier to do with DITA than like with, with docs as code. So um, I, it's, it's a, yeah, I, I don't think I really have, I would say that I would try to make it very clear that it's an end-to-end -end example. Um, I would try to reuse whatever I can and then just get specific. I, I, I'm not, not really answering this very well because I can think of so many different ways that this could be done. Um, no worries. We have, we're having the same problem. We're trying to discover where what, what's the exact right direction. And talking about the workflows, we, I mean, we've been looking at different tools um on how to to uh make that more effective we looked at like draw io dot io if you know what that is and some others but uh, we're still recent researching another one that it's kind of interactive where you can see the workflow and then as you kind of scroll your mouse it zooms in and gives you more detail like if you're on google maps you see like this broad view and as you go down you can see the street street details mm -hmm. it kind of does something like that um any any advice on workflow things? i have not worked with those tools and in open source tools like that uh, anything is, is rather new to me i've never done best practices that use those kind of tools and i'd be very interested to learn more about that and i'm sorry that i don't have any kind of solution for that um for you or any ideas around that mm -hmm. um but i, I would, would just say Sorry, sorry to insert yeah, that. I would just encourage Leo to stay around for the breakout rooms. We could probably just make that a discussion. Like, I'm sure a lot of people here on the call might have some helpful feedback for you, Leo, if you want to stick around for the breakout rooms that will yeah, follow the awesome. Q&A. Yeah, yeah great suggestion. Thank you, Lelisa. Yeah, cool. Any any more quick questions or is it, do we have, uh, is it time for the breakout rooms now, Lisa? 
I'm okay with um, as long as we have some good questions. It's okay. Like, I, it... I, I have a really quick one, actually, okay. if, and I think you'll find this easy to answer, uh, John Quill. And it's uh, along the your slides, you mentioned renaming uh, something in the software. I think in the guides, you changed admin console to enterprise. And my question, or, or no, did I get yeah. that wrong? Uh, so the question was, um, did you have a say in that label change? Like, uh, was that a you the docs team? Did you have to like meet with someone in product or was that a decision that was kind of passed down? Please change this from admin console. I was just curious how that went. Oh, yeah. Um, actually, um, it was our team's suggestion. We definitely had to get uh, PM um, uh, buy-in with that. Um, but most of the solutions um, were raised up from our team and then um but it was a really good exchange uh there were definitely ideas that came down that some were viable some were not but if the idea wasn't viable then we would say well what is the underlying need here how can we meet the need in a different way and there was a lot of back and forth but that particular label change was was uh the suggestion of our docs team we mm -hmm. have a lot of uh yeah we have a lot of uh uh, respect and I'd say probably a lot of autonomy too as a team. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that's definitely, I found the same uh, in a startup or scale up that you can just suggest, how about we change this label from something to something more meaningful for users, right? Yeah. Oh, and I see you have your hand up, Jeff. Do you want to go ahead and ask yeah, your question? Yeah, I had, a, I had a couple of questions, actually. First first one was you, you inherited this mess of leapfrogging all over the place. <laughs> Did anybody actually defend the concept of, hey, we set it up like this deliberately <laughs> and, and you shouldn't change anything? No. <laughs> Did you get any pushback on that? <laughs> no, they wanted a docs team so badly. <laughs> <laughs> like we don't know what we're doing. Now. I was going to say, how, why did they think that was a good idea to begin with? On the recording, no, they they realized they this is the great thing. They realized that documentation is a real skill set, and they realized they needed to bring in the expertise um, that was needed. And you know, it's the kind of thing where it's like we need to. They did they, they documented things as they went along to meet the need at the time, mm -hmm. but they were trying to develop a product, so they really couldn't keep an eye on how can we best deliver this and then you know they realized oh you know there's room for improvement here so yeah Not a room. <laughs> <laughs> and the second question i had was uh, you talked about your your act as a, as a white labeler so you're you're sending this product out to other people that are then slapping their label on it and and selling it off i'm i'm working the same sort of thing on the other end of it i'm i'm receiving docs from a company that we we have white labeled their product and and how do you treat your how do you treat the, the the docs in that scenario that you hand them over? Do they do like entire pull requests on your whole documentation set and then find and replace <laughs> your name with their name or that sort of thing? Or how do they do that? They can, yeah, they can just copy everything right out of our repo and make the changes they need. We don't assist them with that. It's, that's no, okay. it's them to hire their own writer to, to do that. But we're just trying to make the documentation as good as we can so that they have to do a minimal amount of, of rewriting um, yeah, we're not using any kind of variables like for product names so that they can okay. plug in their own or anything like that. They've they've got to you know search and replace for that. Okay, yep. good. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions, or shall we uh, go for breakout rooms? Before we do, oh, one quick thing I just wanted to say, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, thank you again, John Quill, for your great talk. That was I I like I say a lot of things you said chimed with me and reminded me of things that I've gone through in the past.